Hello, welcome to the Cedar River first quarter 2021 market touchstones update report. My name is Paul Latta and together with my business partner, Baj Kochar, we put together this slideshow today to address the most important factors in the market <clears throat> here in the last few days of March, 2021. I'll be doing the narration of the slideshow today, uh, but Baj and I are both available by email or by telephone or by Zoom to discuss any additional detail or questions you might have. Uh, you can find our contact information on our website, cedarrivercapital.com. With that, let's begin the slideshow. This slide may look familiar. We let off our fourth quarter report with the same slide. Uh, perhaps it's not a surprise amid a pandemic that we begin with some discussion about the pandemic. The pandemic does remain the single biggest factor influencing the markets today, even ahead of the new presidential administration, uh, tensions in Southeast Asia and other important stories. So our slideshow today will begin with some context around the COVID pandemic, then we'll look into the pandemic response uh, at the level of government, the level of industry, uh, the level of society, uh, the people. And then we'll conclude with our discussion of the markets with an emphasis mainly on the stock market, but also including other markets, the bond market, real estate, commodities and currencies. This slide is from the CDC vaccine tracker showing US vaccination progress. Uh, the picture on the left just shows total number of vaccines given uh, by vaccine type. So you can see the, the lead horse in the horse race there. Pfizer has, has delivered or given 69 million vaccines. Moderna right behind it at 64 million vaccines. Johnson & Johnson just shy of 3 million. Of course, for the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, you do need to give two vaccines per person to be fully immunized. So the table on the right, or the picture on the right rather, shows we have uh, for Pfizer, 24 million people that have been fully vaccinated. Uh, for Moderna, uh, uh, 21 million people that have been fully vaccinated with the Moderna vaccine. And for Johnson & Johnson, which is a one and done vaccine, just shy of 3 million still. Add up these uh, three on the right and you have about 48 million people as of a few days ago here in late March uh, that have been fully vaccinated. Now that's on a total, of course, in America of about 325 million people. So that means about 15% of America is fully immunized at this point. Of course, there's an emphasis on the more vulnerable people, the elderly, those with compromised health, uh, healthcare workers, of course, other necessary public facing workers. So the US is making progress in its vaccine program, though it is still early. This picture is from the Reuters homepage, but these same charts are updated and published daily by nearly all major national news outlets. So this shouldn't be new information for most people who watch or read the news. We mainly put the slide in the slideshow for context, so we're all on the same page. The picture on the left is new COVID infections. The picture on the right is US daily COVID deaths. And as you can see, both charts spiked a few months ago, but are now sharply declining. Uh, the decline appears to be part seasonal due to fewer holiday gatherings. And it's also partly vaccine success with the rollout of the new vaccines beginning in November, December. So the declining trend is, is good news so far. Vaccines are being rolled out all over the world, but the rollouts are not happening at the same pace. Now, clearly from this chart here, you can see that the US and the UK are well ahead of most of the rest of the world. This chart is from Our World and Data and shows COVID doses per 100 people. And as you can see, the US and the UK, well, they're well ahead of Europe and Asia, Latin America, et cetera. And I might mention the chart does not distinguish whether the vaccines are from two-shot regimes like Pfizer and Moderna or from a one-shot regime like a Johnson & Johnson, but it still does give a sense of relative ranking of how the US and the UK are compared to other regions of the world, which are definitely lagging behind. COVID is resurging in most European countries, which may not be a surprise given the low vaccination rate seen on the previous slide. One notable exception here on this picture is the UK there at the bottom right, where infection rates are low. Again, probably not a surprise given the high vaccination rates in the UK. Indeed, the trajectory of the UK infection rate is very similar to that of the US that we saw in slide number four, the only other country with a high vaccination rate. So it appears vaccinations are making a difference. Uh, notably, the vaccinations are increasing in Europe. The bottlenecks to vaccinations are not really an unwillingness to be vaccinated, but rather it's regulatory issues, production issues, logistics issues, issues that will be addressed in time, uh, likely sooner rather than later. Quite a few headlines around the number of COVID mutations the picture here on the right shows a few dozen of the higher profile mutations along with their lineages. A few points here though about mutations. First, there's a bit of a comic book induced fear of mutations that mutations can give you superpowers like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or maybe the various X-Men mutants. 
but actually most mutations generally weaken the host, not strengthen the host. Uh, beneficial mutations do happen, but they are rare. Uh, second point, uh, COVID does mutate fairly slowly for a virus, about half the rate of the seasonal flu, and nowhere near the speed of the higher profile uh, uh, rapidly mutating viruses like HIV or hepatitis C. So scientists actually stand a decent chance of getting ahead of any possible COVID mutations here. Uh, lastly, uh, most mutations are actually not altering the antibody target, which suggests that the vaccines are mostly going to be still effective against most of the, uh, most of the mutations that are out there. That said, there are a few mutations making headlines, and we'll discuss these on the next slide. There are three COVID mutations making headlines these days, the UK variant, the South Africa variant, and the Brazil variant. Uh, the table on the right is from Luke Timmerman's website, which provides a little bit more detail on each of these, though the table is about a month old and we have a bit more knowledge on each now. But looking at each of the three mutations from the least threatening to the most threatening, uh, the least threatening, uh, probably the UK variant, uh, while it did get quite a few headlines here a few months ago when it was evident that there was a, a mutation spreading that had a 40% or higher uh, increased level of transmissibility, uh, the lethality does not appear to be meaningfully worse. It is perhaps a little bit worse, but more importantly, it does appear from early stage uh, human data as well as in vitro data <clears throat> that the vaccines are indeed effective against this particular variant. So it is something we do have to watch, but it does again appear that the vaccines are effective against the UK variant. The South Africa variant, a little bit more concerning. Um, it does have increased transmissibility as well as uh, lethality, not quite as uh, dramatically so as the UK variant. Uh, but what's more concerning about the South Africa variant is it appears that the vaccines are only about half to two thirds of effective against the South Africa variant in comparison to the non-mutated COVID virus. So we do have to watch this one a little bit closer. Uh, all three of these data points, uh, transmissibility, lethality, and immune escape, are evolving uh, for, for the South Africa variant. So again, we'll have to keep an eye on that. Uh, the most concerning variant, of course, is the Brazil uh, variant, the P1 variant, uh, mainly since this mutation, mutation traced its lineage to a population that was regarded as previously infected. So the variant appears to evolve some form of antibody resistance, resistance <clears throat> that basically suggests the vaccines will have little effect. It's about twice as contagious as the non-mutated COVID, and unlike non-mutated COVID, uh, younger people are not disproportionately protected. In other words, it goes after old people and young people. As of the date of this chart, the variant was limited to only seven countries, though it's spread to over 20 now, so it's clearly spreading. This one is clearly the mutation that's most in the gun sites of epidemiologists and infectious disease experts, so we'll definitely have to keep an eye on this uh, Brazil variant. So as we've seen from prior slides, the vaccines are making good progress in the US and the UK. Uh, we do still need to pay attention very closely to the mutations. We're not out of the woods yet. I'd like to change topics now and move away from looking at the details of COVID, but rather look at the response to COVID at the level of government, industry, and society. This slide captures the response of the US government, both fiscal and monetary actions. Since our Prior Touchstones report back in December, the big fiscal news, of course, is the passage of the $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan just a few weeks ago. This follows the CARES Act and the CARES Extension both of last year. Uh, the new and comprehensive fiscal support included uh, $1,400 direct payments to individuals, food stamp benefits, grants to small business, uh, education funding, assistance to state and local governments to mitigate their fiscal shock, uh, rental assistance, a very comprehensive plan. Um, on the monetary front, uh, quantitative easing continues, uh, not quite at the same pace as the early days of the COVID shock, uh, but still at the pace we've been seeing for the last six months, maybe more. Uh, notably, when you look at uh, both fiscal and monetary response, those uh, numbers are quite large, but most governments outside the U.S. are also responding with sizable monetary and fiscal stimulus measures of, of similar orders of magnitude. Uh, this is a worldwide uh, effort. Looking at the U.S. fiscal response to the COVID crisis, the fiscal response has been larger than that of most other countries, but not dramatically so. Uh, this chart compares the fiscal, res fiscal response as a percentage of gross domestic product, and the U.S. here is ranked number two behind Japan. Uh, though when you look at the footnotes, you can see there is some dispute over the Japanese figure, and it might make sense to toss uh, Japan from this uh, sampling here. Also, the U.S. response does include the recently passed $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan, which might skew the numbers a little bit high for America. And if you pulled those back, it might end up in the low 20s instead of the upper 20s. Uh, regardless, whether you use the figure uh, 
with or without the American CARES Act and include or exclude Japan, I think it's fair to say that the U.S. response is not too far from that of other developed countries. It's probably a little higher on average, but it's not two to three X, it's maybe a few percentage points higher. The last chart looked at the U.S. fiscal response. Now we'll move on to the U.S. monetary response. This chart looks at total assets of the Fed, which has increased with much of the bond buying as part of the Fed's quantitative easing program. <clears throat> the size of the Fed balance sheet rose dramatically, of course, at the outset of COVID, as shown in yellow at the right of the chart. Indeed, the quantitative easing in the COVID 2020 recession actually dwarfs the quantitative easing from the 2008 subprime recession. And while the pace of quantitative easing has slackened off, it's still on the rise. To quantify this, we're now at about $7.7 .7 trillion on the Fed balance sheet. And while this sounds scary, as we show on the next slide, the U.S. monetary response has actually been a little less than that of most developed countries. This is arguably one of the more important slides in our presentation, mainly since it clears up a common misunderstanding. In the prior slide, we showed that the U.S. Federal Reserve now has $7.7 .7 trillion in assets on its balance sheet thanks to an aggressive quantitative easing program. <clears throat> Yet when measured as a percentage of gross domestic product, uh, the U.S. central bank balance sheet is actually more conservative than most of the largest global central banks, including the European Central Bank, Bank of Japan, People's Bank of China. A common misunderstanding seems to be arising from the less informed Bitcoin investors taking uninformed pot shots at the U.S. dollar. Yes, the U.S. dollar did in fact weaken last year, but mainly due to reversing the huge flight to safety rally in the U.S. dollar in the early days of the COVID crisis uh, earlier in the year. <clears throat> Yet the Bitcoin narrative seemed to insist that the weakness was due to America's overambitious fiscal and monetary response, quantitative easing in particular, a form of money printing, seems to be met with the most derision by the Bitcoin crowd. Hopefully the slide clears the air on how QE stands in the US compared to the rest of the world. Yes, the US is printing money, but the rest of the world is printing a lot faster, which is bullish for the US dollar, not bearish. Sorry, Bitcoin investors. We've discussed this slide before in our prior Touchstones update, but we thought it important to re-include it, mainly just for context. Uh, while money supply has been lifting persistently over the years, as shown here, the rise in the last year is it's really unprecedented. Uh, this is mainly due to the monetary and fiscal efforts, as we've been discussing in the prior sl three slides. <clears throat> Sharp rises in money supply can result in inflation. It's clearly an inflationary pressure. However, that is an outcome that may actually meet the Fed's approval given the policy change last August, moving from a 2% inflation cap to a 2% inflation target, and with a tacit acceptance of short-term inflation deviations above 2%. Basically, the Fed wants a little bit of inflation. And so this surge in money supply, well, that may be just what the Fed is looking for. Now, there are other factors, of course, pushing against inflation, some deflationary pressures out there. Uh, top of the list would be, of course, COVID, but there's uh, also some velocity issues and a few other factors we'll talk about in a moment. With the sizable fiscal and monetary stimulus efforts in the U.S. and countries around the world, it may not be a huge surprise to see that not all of that money is being put straight back to work into the economy. Much of it's actually sitting idle in passbook savings account and not really being recycled back into the, into the world or into the economy. The chart on the left looks at this excess savings by country in the first nine months of the year. U.S. is high on the list, though actually Canada is actually top on the list. Uh, the second chart actually acknowledges that this excess savings is, is in fact a moving target and looks at just the U.S. increase in excess savings over the course of last year, uh, a number that you can see fading over the course of the year. Uh, it seems the excess savings was actually meaningfully worked off by uh, near the year end, uh, and the Implication is that, well, maybe that $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan just passed a few weeks ago was actually kind of timely. While the money supply increase is clearly inflationary, the higher money supply is battling against the deflationary forces of a collapse in money velocity. Uh, famous monetarist economist Milton Friedman used to argue that lower money velocity was the root cause of the Great Depression and the only way out was with increased money supply. And while that's admittedly a very monetarist point of view. If true, well, then the central banks around the world are actually doing a very admirable job fighting the deflationary effects of a COVID-induced collapse in money velocity with an unprecedented increase in money supply. It's a, if you look back to 2008, in fact, when money velocity had a similar collapse amid the subprime Great Recession, the economy did recover, yet the velocity did not. Instead, excess money supply from quantitative easing basically plugged the hole. <clears throat> 
have a hunch we're going to get a repeat of that scenario. So we're going to move on from the government monetary and fiscal response now, and the next few slides are going to look at various macroeconomic aggregates, mainly to take a temperature of the actual economy, not the market, but the actual economy. This slide looks at gross domestic product forecasts for 2021. Ordinarily, GDP is the single most important measure of an economy and its vitality, but forecasting gross domestic product or GDP in recent quarters has been unprecedentedly difficult, mainly due to the 30% plus collapse in the second quarter of 2020 GDP last year, followed by the 30% plus recovery in the third quarter of 2020 last year. <laughs> Those quarterly gyrations in GDP are actually the largest on record by a very wide margin, records that go all the way back to World War II. Still, despite the difficulty in forecasting when you have such a difficult year to compare to, it's, it is important to understand where we're at and what the street consensus is. So here we have it. U.S.'s uh, forecast consensus is 5.8 percent, Europe 4.4 percent, China 8.3 percent, Japan 2.3 percent. And also on the right-hand side, you can see uh, second quarter, third quarter uh, U.S. forecast of over 8 percent. That's actually a very bullish forecast. Now, clearly, that does embed an expectation of some level of post-vaccine COVID recovery and post-vaccine reopening, maybe not full uh, uh, COVID recovery or full reopening, but some level. And so uh, that explains the big numbers in the middle of the year. So anyway, we know that the consensus figures are not going to be stable. There's going to be a uh, movement over the course of the year. There's a wide dispersion of individual estimates even right now. Still, we believe they're not too far, from, too far off from what we would actually expect them to be. These are fairly reasonable. Earnings estimates are gradually starting to recover. You can see in the blue line, uh, S&P 500 earnings estimates for 2021. Prior to COVID, uh, Street was estimating about $192, $193 a share. Uh, presently, the Street estimates have actually recovered. We're at $173 per share. <clears throat> when we actually get to the end of 2021, it may be 175, 180, actually not too shabby. Uh, down five or 10% from where it was pre-COVID. Uh, that that's not a bad recovery. Now, of course, not all sectors are recovering nicely. Some are still struggling mightily, in particular, the travel industry and some of the restaurant, sit down restaurant businesses, destination entertainment. Uh, in contrast, uh, there are some businesses uh, that are doing quite well, the stay at home businesses, the Amazons, the Netflix, the Domino's Pizza. And we'll talk about that in, in later slides. As mentioned in the prior slide, there are signs of recovery and earnings estimates are improving, but clearly there are hot spots and cold spots at this stage in the COVID pandemic. On the graph on the left, you can see post COVID a, a dip followed by a surge in demand for personal goods, but at the expense of personal services. A goods demand was not just toilet paper and Clorox wipes, but it was broad based, included things like cell phones and home remodeling goods, computers and more. Uh, similarly, services was not just cruise lines, but it was also restaurants and barbershops, hotels and whatnot. So the goods are doing well, services not doing so well. The picture on the right actually maps out how to view the COVID impact by distinguishing acceleration of demand from acceleration of adoption. The top left of this map is COVID-driven acceleration of adoption. This is the quadrant of Zoom video. If COVID is cured tomorrow, revenue will just won't revert back to pre-COVID levels. In contrast, the bottom left is mere acceleration of demand, and this is the place where the, the quadrant where the toilet paper companies live, like Cascades and Clearwater. If COVID is cured tomorrow, uh, toilet paper will revert to pre-COVID levels, in contrast to what, what's happening at Zoom with acceleration of adoption. On the top right, we have deceleration of demand, and I think the poster child here is the orthopedics companies, companies like Stryker and Zimmer Biomet. Uh, where they're seeing uh, temporary deferring of, say, knee replacements, but demand will revert quickly if COVID is cured tomorrow. And at the bottom right, we have deceleration of adoption. Uh, travel and restaurant industries are the poster children there. And they picked up a fairly big stigma of infection risk. If COVID is cured tomorrow, revenue will not revert right away to pre-COVID levels. Uh, Airbus, for example, is still saying global air travel, while forecast to improve over the next several years, is coming from a very deep hole. And so the current rate of improvement won't get back to 2019 levels until at least 2025, an outlook that's about in line with the street consensus. So anyway, with this map in mind, it's easier to assess which sectors should be rallying and which should be in more of a holding pattern. We occasionally get asked by investment customers about how the average everyman on the street feels about the economy. More pointedly, as professional investors are actually sometimes criticized for being out of touch with the everyman on the street, 
since we specifically deal with ultra high net worth individuals and ind institutional investors that are not exactly representative of the masses. Alas, though, the economics profession has already risen to this challenge of identifying precisely how the common man on the street feels about the future in the economy. This chart is one of such surveys. This is the monthly University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Survey. <clears throat> Clearly, the onset of COVID struck a fairly big blow to consumer sentiment, as you can see in the yellow on this chart to the right. That said, we're nowhere near as low as we were during the 2008 Great Recession in the gray on the far left of the chart. Good news, too, is that the trend, is, uh, trend in the recent months is actually not worsening. In fact, it's actually modestly lifted from the lows in recent months. Of all the ways to measure the health of economy, the unemployment numbers are near the top of the list up there with gross domestic product and consumer sentiment. Politicians are especially sensitive to keeping people out of the unemployment lines. However, the unemployment figures are frequently criticized for overreaching on simplifying assumptions about what defines unemployed in particular for defining the difference between a discouraged worker and, a, and an unemployed worker. Wall Street professionals uh, have generally ignored the untrustworthy unemployment number and usually just look at non-farm payrolls, a little bit more trustworthy, a little bit more of a, a raw number, but a more trustworthy number. This chart here shows the sharp decline and then halfway rebound amid COVID in the far right side of this in the yellow. Um, and it's interesting to compare this to uh, the Great Recession of 2008 uh, in the chart here on the gray on the left. Uh, it seems we had a more gradual, long-lasting decline in 2008. It took uh, nearly six years to get back to the pre-recession levels. Uh, it's interesting when looking at employment or unemployment, it is actually a lagging economic indicator, not a leading indicator. It's very important. It's leading in that sense, but it's lagging from an economic indicator perspective, despite what politicians may say. Uh, in reality, employers are always very reluctant to commit to hiring unless they are certain that they can feed their new employees and that they're similarly reluctant to fire employees. So employment and unemployment, they're always lagging indicators. Very important, but lagging indicators nonetheless. The last several slides gave us a picture of the economy, but not the markets. So we'll now take a look specifically at the markets. Uh, this first slide here is mainly to highlight the fact that the heavy fiscal and monetary stimulus in the last year has clearly lifted the stock market, but it's much, much more than the stock market. In fact, the year 2020 will be remembered for what pundits are referring to as the everything rally. <laughs> Literally every asset class rallied strong in 2020, stocks, bonds, real estate, commodities, foreign currencies, private equity, artwork, you name it. The year 2020, that's the year of the everything rally. I'd like to drill down just a little bit more into the stock and bond market. Uh, these two charts just show simple 10-year histories of the S&P 500 stock index and the aggregate bond index, and both are near all-time highs, as you uh, may not be surprised, after the everything rally. Uh, there has been actually a little bit, little bit of softness in bonds just in the recent few weeks, uh, but still fairly close to all-time highs for both the stock and bond market indexes. This chart is what's known as the periodic table of returns. The table basically breaks down the stock and bond market into 10 of the most common subcategories based on things like asset class, geography, market cap, investment styles, and so on. There's quite a few variations of this table, sometimes restricting the table to just say the bond market, but then breaking the bond market into 10 different subcategories, maybe investment grade bonds and high yield bonds and foreign bonds and so on. Several observations could be made here. Uh, first, um, you can see the bond market has a tendency to do well when the stock market is not doing well. That, that's basically showing the bonds are behaving the way they're supposed to. Uh, secondly, uh, you'll notice that when a particular category uh, does well in maybe perhaps in the top quartile for a few years in a row, there's a tendency for that to be a campaign that runs for a lengthier period of time. <clears throat> and when that campaign goes out of fashion, it stays out of fashion for several years. So, and you can see in the emerging markets, 2003 to 2007, I actually have a tendency to look at that as the weak dollar period of 03 through 2013. And the emerging markets did well throughout most of that period of time. Similarly, growth stocks have been in sort of a strong dollar growth stock environment through 2014 through the present time. And uh, another related observation, you can see that there's a tendency for growth stocks to do well when value stocks are doing poorly and vice versa. Um, looking at 2020 in a little bit more detail, the most recent year, uh, you can see that a very good year for growth stocks. Russell 2000 growth was the best performer there up on the top right of the table. Very close to underneath it was the S&P 500 growth index, only about a percent and a half below. Uh, 
Uh, down at the bottom, you can see the S&P 500 value index, again, sort of highlighting the fact that when growth does well, value doesn't do so well. That said, uh, we did have a strong recovery in value stocks at the very tail end of the year in the fourth quarter, and uh, a rally in value stocks that seems to be continuing uh, to this day into the first quarter of 2021. On the next slide, we'll drill down a little bit deeper into equities and the investment styles that were in fashion. This is another version of the periodic table of returns, but this one is restricted to just U.S. equities and breaking down equities by seven of the most common investment styles. The first observation, as mentioned on the previous slide, is that the growth campaign uh, through 2020 remains in vogue, and value stocks have been struggling, struggling through most of 2020. While there's a limited history on story stocks, the most aggressive form of growth investing, the story stocks have been the best stocks in the last couple of years. It's been a very good time to own Tesla or, or uh, HubSpot or CRISPR or one of those really, really great sounding stories. Uh, Tesla, for the record, also would have done really well during the dot-com uh, story stock environment of the late 90s, though in 2003 through 2007, when those story stock uh, sector was under great pressure and emerging markets were taking all the mind share, that probably would not have been a good time uh, for Tesla to be a public company in 2003 through 2007. Look at value stocks, uh, a little bit curious here, but they were clearly weak in 2020, not a huge surprise there, but they've actually performed fairly well in 2021. And some people have chalked this up to the so-called everything rally that we talked about on the earlier slides. But a big factor driving value stocks is the earnings improvement we're being seeing at the early value chain commodity producers that are big parts of those indexes. Uh, many of those were closed in for COVID, but are now seeing wholesale restocking in anticipation of a vaccine-driven recovery. Yet the production for these commodities is still closed in because of things like mill shutdowns and COVID labor, labor restrictions. And so we're getting uh, epic price increases. And of course, with the inflation-friendly Fed, commodity prices are now sitting here at multi-year highs. <laughs> so, so value may uh, have a uniquely solid year, despite the many factors that are actually still supporting the growth campaign. We may actually have a, uh, a little bit of a contrarian move in value stocks that might run through most of 2021. If you look at some of these other uh, investment styles, uh, high beta seems to be seeing a good start to the year, actually for similar reasons that we're seeing with value stocks, since a lot of those indexes contain uh, many of the early value chain names and names that were sort of dogs in the Dow that people like to bet on recovery. So some of those high beta names are actually doing quite well. It's actually the best performing investment style here to date so far, even ahead of the story stocks. If you look kind of at the, uh, well, actually the income stocks, it's kind of in the middle of the uh, stack here. Um, income stocks have not done so well in, in recent years, uh, more of a market performing uh, style this year. Uh, my personal belief uh, is that income stocks have a tendency to trade uh, a little bit like bonds, uh, not particularly bullish on bonds right now. Uh, interest rates close to zero, uh, and so that does suggest that income stocks don't really have a whole lot of upside from here. Uh, <clears throat> what about low volatility? Uh, well, uh, low volatility had a great year in 2018, but you'll notice the S&P 500 was actually down that year. In fact, that's probably a good way to think about low volatility, similar to income. It's a, I hesitate to call it a bond equivalent because low volatility doesn't imply any actual income. Uh, but, but when the market is actually down, people have a tendency to run into those Walmarts and Procter and Gambles and Costco's and those types of low volatility names that are, that are a big part of those indexes. So low volatility. Uh, not such great years in the last two years, uh, not such a great start to this year, but had a, a really solid year in 2018. Uh, that was the style uh, that worked in a year when the S&P was actually down 4%. Anyway, this is a little bit of a map, just talking about investment styles. It's a little bit hard to get a hold of this map, uh, and so it's it's good to actually see this uh, in, in you know, pictorial form uh, where it can be discussed. One sign of a strong stock market is a strong corporate finance market, including initial public offerings, secondary offerings, mergers and acquisitions. Our prior deck talked about the fact that the IPO market eclipsed the 1999.com record uh, for numbers of number of IPOs, evidently a, another indication that we are clearly in an everything rally. <clears throat> One of the unusual side effects of an IPO market that has been the rise of the backdoor IPO via the SPAC market or the Special Purpose Acquisition Company. Now the chart on the left shows the cumulative capital raised via the SPAC market beginning about the onset of COVID and the subsequent monetary and fiscal stimulus. Clearly, this is a sign of a frothy market. 
the table on the right lists some of the more unusual SPACs that have been listed in recent months. Um, some slightly amusing names, the Axe SPAC, the SPAC SPAC, the Shack SPAC, the Sports SPAC. Anyway, uh, some unusual names there, some slightly amusing, uh, but clearly this is a sign of a frothy market. We've used this chart on the left in prior presentations, and we loved it so much that we supplemented it with the complementary chart on the right. Both charts show that stocks are inexpensive relative to bonds. Both charts also show that stocks and bonds were comparably valued from about 1980 to just after about 2000, but the valuation spread has been widening ever since. The chart on the left compares the 10-year Treasury bond to the earnings yield of the S&P 500. The earnings yield is basically the upside-down P-E ratio, or the earnings to price, price ratio. <clears throat> For those who's, who can't really get their mind around the earnings to price ratio, it's not very intuitive. Uh, the second chart actually just uses the S&P 500 P-E ratio, but then compares it to the reciprocal of the bond yield to make it apples to apples. Both charts basically show that stocks are clearly cheap relative to bonds. My favorite interpretation, though, is that stocks should be about threefold higher in order to match the price of bonds today. With bond yields near zero for most of last year, many investors actually felt they were being forced into stocks because there is no alternative, uh, now commonly referred to by its acronym for there is no alternative, or TINA. <clears throat> While originally TINA was coined by Margaret Thatcher in the direction of her government, uh, TINA does actually indeed seem to capture a main driver for stocks in the last year. After all, stocks are cheap compared to bonds. Stocks can appreciate, unlike bonds, with earnings growth. And stocks, of course, are liquid. This slide is mainly a reminder that real estate does actually have a bond-like character and is sensitive to interest rates. <clears throat> As you can see here, this is cap rates, uh, more commercial real estate versus uh, bond yields, uh, going back over the last almost 30-some years. Uh, not a perfect correlation, but a broad correlation, not really a surprise. Uh, bottom line, with rates at near zero uh, here in the last year or so, the real estate market has also performed well along with the stock market. In other words, uh, part of the everything rally. This is looking more specifically at residential real estate nationwide using the Case-Shiller 20 index and looking mainly at year-over-year -year growth instead of the actual index. It's interesting to see that real estate is indeed rallying, but as is common with real estate, it does lag the stock market, which is you know mainly due to the fact that real estate is an illiquid market. The stock market, in other words, had a really big, strong rally in April, May, June, July, and that's about when the real estate market just started to pick up. For those who work in the industry, the more pressing issue is not necessarily the price increases that we're seeing, but it's actually uh, the inventory of homes for sale is dropping to very, very, very low levels. Uh, home construction has spiked in recent months. In fact, uh, housing starts and building permits hit uh, 10 plus year highs uh, in the late summer, early fall. And so uh, perhaps that will alleviate uh, some of the inventory issues that uh, the real estate agents are facing these days. Just to put a little bit more color on the low inventory challenges in the residential real estate market, uh, you can see here now that there are actually more real estate agents than there are homes for sale. Uh, Inventory in particular down 29% year over year. It's a fairly steep decline uh, from an already low level down to 1.03 million units. Uh, by comparison, National Association of Real Realtors membership right now is actually near a record high at 1.448 million, up 5% year over year. So uh, a lot of agents out there, but uh, the inventory is really at a very, very low level. I have to switch from the real estate market now to the commodity market. As we alluded to in our discussion of the periodic table of returns, the commodity markets are booming despite the economy not really being fully recovered. What's going on? Well, almost all the commodities are facing the same situation of restricted supply due to COVID shutdowns and labor restrictions, yet strong wholesaler stocking in anticipation of vaccine-driven COVID recovery. The story is identical in the lumber industry, the oil industry, the copper industry, the, the semiconductor industry, even in the least, less economically sensitive uh, agricultural commodities like corn and wheat and soybeans. About the only commodity that's not really moving uh, precious metals, uh, gold in particular, uh, on the list of reasons for why uh, gold might be being held back. There's a handful, but uh, probably the highest profile one is that it appears gold is being replaced rightly or wrongly as a mo monetary alternative by, by Bitcoin. 
and so it seems to be losing a little share to Bitcoin. Anyway, commodity markets are rallying, uh, in particular energy, agriculture, and base metals, not so much the precious metals though. The graph on the right puts a little bit more color on the rally in oil, though this chart looks very similar to the charts for most of the other commodities on the prior slide. Uh, also, the chart on the left does a pretty good job of putting a picture to the story of restricted supply, also a chart that you could probably overlay with many of the commodities on the prior slide. So again, we have that situation with wholesalers trying to stock up. At the same time, we have the chart on the left with all the restricted supply, and consequently, we end up with the chart on the right with the rallying price in the commodity. I'd like to switch now from the commodity market to the currency market and in particular look at the trade weighted U.S. dollar. If we, as we've mentioned before earlier in the show, uh, the U.S. dollar spiked with the onset of COVID in the classic flight to safety move, reflecting the U.S. dollar status as the world's reserve currency. And you can see that in yellow on this chart on the right, the big spike in the early part of the COVID days. Uh, but with the onset of the monetary and fiscal stimulus around April, uh, March, April, uh, at all the central banks of size around the world, the U.S. dollar actually did begin to revert uh, over the course of most of 2020, and indeed actually overshot a little bit during the first quarter of this year. Uh, in recent weeks, uh, U.S. dollar has actually bounced again, actually finally showing a little bit of signs of stabilization. In fact, uh, the stabilization seems to arrive a little bit later than what, what you might guess based on interest rate parity, and we'll uh, talk about that on the next slide. There's been many headlines around the sharp rise in the U.S. 10-year treasury rates uh, in the last few months, but the rise is really only happening in the U.S., nowhere else in the rest of the world. These four charts compare the spread between the U.S. 10-year Treasury and the 10-year Treasury in Europe, in Japan, in the U.K., and in Korea, and it's basically a one-way street, and that way is down. In other words, U.S. rates are going higher, and non-U.S. rates aren't moving. <clears throat> but if the U.S. rates are higher, that will draw foreign fixed income investors to arbitrage the situation, which lifts the U.S. dollar, interest rate parity. This has been going on for months, but the U.S. dollar finally started to lift just two or three weeks ago, long overdue. A strong U.S. dollar, of course, has implications for the stock market sector outperformance, and we'll talk a little bit about that on the next slide. We borrowed this slide from the piece on the U.S. dollar on our website, cedarrivercapital.com. If indeed we do have an overdue strengthening of the U.S. dollar, that would be good for the strong dollar sectors like consumer goods, technology, biotechnology. But of course, it'll be a headwind for those sectors that benefit from a weak dollar like raw materials, energy, commodities, emerging markets. Again, please read through our U.S. dollar thought piece on our website, cedarrivercapital.com, if you're curious about the mechanism of this action or need, need a little bit more detail. Uh, one of the other unusual features this year is that uh, we do have that situation with uh, such a big supply demand imbalance in the raw materials side. And we may have one of these situations where the U.S. dollar strong week, it just really won't matter in terms of sector leadership. Uh, indeed, there's a very strong case that the, the everything rally continues. Thank you again for listening to our Cedar River Capital mid-year 2020 market touchstones report. Please feel free to reach out and ping us if you have any questions or comments. Please take a look at our website, cedarrivercapital.com. And again, thank you for listening and thank you for tuning in.